Hello, and welcome back to Off the Deaton Path. I'm Stan Deaton with the Georgia Historical Society, and we welcome you to this podcast for August 12, 2021. We are broadcasting this week from the Elvis Has Left the Building division here at the Georgia Historical Society on the 15th floor of the Jepson House overlooking beautiful Forsyth Park in historic downtown Savannah. We'll be talking about the passing of the king as well as the death of a man responsible for one of the most iconic photographs in history from World War II. And we'll also be talking about what's new on the Off the Deaton Path bookshelf. Let's begin, as we always do, with the ever-popular, fascinating look at the events that happened this week in history. On August 12, 1877, 144 years ago, Thomas Edison perfected the invention of the phonograph, making it possible to capture sound and preserve it, seemingly forever. This was a breakthrough moment in technology that continues, of course, to have an impact on us in the 21st century. A phonograph, also called a record player, reproduced sounds by means of the vibration of a stylus, or needle, following a groove on a rotating disc. A phonograph disc, or record, stores a replica of sound waves as a series of undulations in a sinuous groove inscribed on its rotating surface by the stylus. When the record is played back, another stylus responds to the undulations, and its motions are then reconverted into sound. Makes sense, right? The 78 RPM came along in 1915, followed by electric loudspeakers in the 1920s. The LP, or Long Playing Record, in 1948, invented by Columbia Records at 33 and a third RPM, followed shortly after by RCA inventing the 45 RPM, which became universally famous in the 1950s as the single, which revolutionized the music industry when stereo became widespread commercially in 1958. Phonographs and records remained popular until the 1980s when they were supplanted by compact discs, though LPs are, as you probably know, making a strong comeback. Now, this whole technology was epitomized in the life and career of a man named Alvis Edgar Owens Jr., who was born also on August 12, 1929, 92 years ago, in Sherman, Texas. As Buck Owens, he would go on to be one of the most popular and successful musicians in the 20th century, revolutionizing country music with the Bakersfield sound, the first subgenre of country music to be influenced by rock and roll, relying heavily on electric instrumentation and a strongly defined backbeat. It was also a reaction against the slickly produced orchestra-laden Nashville sound, which was becoming popular in the late 1950s. The Bakersfield sound became one of the most popular and influential country genres of the 1960s, initiating a revival of honky-tonk music and influencing later country rock and outlaw country musicians. Buck Owens would go on to record 21 number one hits on the country music charts, influencing an entire generation of musicians. Buck Owens died on March 25, 2006, at age 76, and is buried in Greenlawn Southwest Mortuary and Cemetery in Bakersfield, California. On August 13, 1521, 500 years ago, Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés captured the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan after a 93-day siege, ending the Aztec Empire and conquering Mexico for the crown of Spain. He renamed the capital Mexico City and for the next three years governed Mexico personally. Cortes died in Spain on December 2nd, 1547 at the age of 62, but he wished to be buried in Mexico. His body was buried and moved many times until final burial in the Church of the Immaculate Conception in Mexico City. Also on that date, August 13th, 1899, 122 years ago, Alfred Hitchcock was born in London. He went on to become one of the most influential motion picture directors in Hollywood history, and his films read like a hall of fame for the greatest movies ever made. Rebecca, Foreign Correspondent, Suspicion, Saboteur, Shadow of a Doubt, Lifeboat, Rope, Spellbound, Notorious, Strangers on a Train, Dial M for Murder, North by Northwest, The Birds, Psycho, Rear Window, To Catch a Thief, The Trouble with Harry, Vertigo, 
The Man Who Knew Too Much, and of course his great television series also, Alfred Hitchcock Presents. He was, in the best sense, the master of suspense, the director of over 50 films, and his sense of what would scare an audience was pure genius. Hitchcock made uh, many famous cameo appearances in his films, and his films garnered 46 Academy Award nominations and six wins, though he never won Best Director, believe it or not, though nominated five times. Famously, Cary Grant and Jimmy Stewart both worked with Hitchcock four times, and Ingrid Bergman and Grace Kelly three times each. Alfred Hitchcock died of kidney failure on April 29, 1980, at the age of 80. He was cremated, and his ashes were spread over the Pacific Ocean. On August 14, 1935, 86 years ago, the Social Security Act was passed as part of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal legislation. By the 1930s, the United States was the only modern industrial country without any national system of Social Security. In the midst of the Great Depression, the physician Francis Townsend galvanized support behind a proposal to issue direct payments to the elderly, an old-age pension, if you will. Responding to that movement, Roosevelt organized a committee led by Secretary of Labor Francis Perkins to develop a major social welfare program proposal. Roosevelt presented the plan in early 1935 to Congress, and he signed the Social Security Act into law on August 14, 1935. It provided old age benefits to be financed by a payroll tax on employers and employees. The system was later extended to include dependents, the disabled, and other groups. The act was upheld by the Supreme Court in two major cases decided in 1937. FDR biographer Kenneth Davis described the Social Security Act, quote, as the most important single piece of social legislation in all American history, unquote. Two iconic figures of 19th century military and literary history were both born on August 15th, two years apart. On August 15th, 1769, 252 years ago, Napoleon Bonaparte was born in Corsica. He went on, of course, to become a French military and political leader who rose to prominence during the French Revolution and led several successful campaigns during the French Revolutionary Wars. He was the de facto leader of the French Republic as First Consul from 1799 to 1804. As Napoleon I, he was Emperor of the French from 1804 until 1814 and again in 1815. Napoleon dominated European and global affairs for more than a decade while leading France against a series of coalitions in the Napoleonic Wars. He won most of those wars and the vast majority of his battles, building a large empire that ruled over continental Europe before its final collapse in 1815. One of the greatest military commanders in history, his wars and campaigns are still studied at military schools worldwide. He remains one of the most celebrated and one of the most controversial political figures in history. Napoleon died on May 5, 1821 at the age of 51 and was first buried on St. Helena, where he was exiled. In 1840, Louis-Philippe I obtained permission from the British government to return Napoleon's remains to France, and in 1861 he was entombed in a sarcophagus of red quartzite from Russia in the crypt under the dome in Les Invalides in Paris. Two years after Napoleon's birth, on August 15, 1771, 250 years ago, Walter Scott was born in Edinburgh, Scotland. The Scottish novelist, poet, historian, and biographer is often considered both the inventor and the greatest practitioner of the historical novel. The Waverley Novels are a great series of novels written by Sir Walter Scott between 1814 and 1832. For nearly a century, they were among the most popular and widely read novels in Europe and include Waverley, Ivanhoe, and Rob Roy. It was Sir Walter Scott who created the mythical Scots Highlander image that has become so prominent in popular culture. Walter Scott died on September 21, 1832 at the age of 61 and is buried at Dryburgh Abbey in Melrose, Scotland. Two icons of 20th century literary and popular culture both died on August 16th. Margaret Mitchell, author of Gone with the Wind, died on August 16, 1949, 72 years ago, at age 48, from injuries she sustained when she was hit by a car crossing Peachtree Street and 13th Street in Atlanta on August 11th. 
She died five days later without fully regaining consciousness. The driver, a man named Hugh Gravitt, was an off-duty taxi driver who was driving his personal vehicle when he struck Mitchell. After the collision, he was arrested for drunken driving and released on bond until her death. He was originally charged with drunken driving, speeding, and driving on the wrong side of the road and was convicted of involuntary manslaughter in November 1949 and sentenced to 18 months in jail. He served almost 11 months. Gravett died in 1994 at the age of 73. Margaret Mitchell is buried in Oakland Cemetery in Atlanta. Also on August 17, 1977, 44 years ago, Elvis Presley died at his home, Graceland, in Memphis, Tennessee, at age 42 of heart disease. The king of rock and roll is still considered to be one of the most significant icons of popular culture in history. On August 17, 1915, 106 years ago, Leo Frank was lynched in Marietta, Georgia at the age of 31 in one of the most notorious acts in one of the darkest episodes in Georgia and American history. Frank was convicted in 1913, two years earlier, of murdering Mary Fagan, a 15-year-old employed by Frank at the National Pencil Factory in Atlanta. Police immediately suspected Frank, a New York Jew, despite strong evidence, against a black employee named Jim Conley. Conley testified that he helped Frank dispose of Fagan's body. Female employees further testified that Frank had made unwanted sexual advances. Leo Frank was convicted and sentenced to die, but two years later, Governor John Slayton commuted Frank's sentence to life in prison. Influential publisher and lawyer Tom Watson urged outraged Georgians to take justice into their own hands. Prominent citizens from Marietta, Fagan's hometown, kidnapped Frank from the state prison in Milledgeville and lynched him after taking him back to Marietta. No one was ever charged in Frank's death. Without addressing his guilt or innocence, but recognizing its failure to protect him, the state of Georgia pardoned Leo Frank in 1986 70 years after he was lynched. Today, the consensus of researchers is that Frank was wrongly convicted and factory employee Jim Conley was likely the actual murderer. Leo Frank is buried in Mount Carmel Cemetery in Glendale, New York. Finally, on August 18, 1920, 101 years ago, the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution extending to women the right to vote was ratified after Tennessee, by just one vote, became the 36th state to approve it, capping the 72-year fight to win women the right to vote in the United States. And seven years later, on August 18, 1927, 94 years ago, Eleanor Rosalind Smith was born in Plains, Georgia. She married Jimmy Carter in 1946 and became First Lady of the United States when he won the presidency in 1976. Carter has been active in advocating for mental health, Habitat for Humanity, and of course, is a strong advocate for women and children. Happy 94th birthday, Mrs. Carter. And that's This Week in History. One obituary of note this week, we've all seen the iconic photograph from World War II of the U.S. Marines planting the American flag on the summit of Mount Suribachi during the Battle of Iwo Jima, the photograph taken by Joe Rosenthal of the Associated Press. Colonel Dave Severance was the commander of the Marine company that raised that flag, inspiring the photograph that thrilled the American home front and became an enduring image of men at war. Dave Severance died on August 1st at his home in San Diego. The flag raising atop Mount Suribachi on February 23, 1945, took place when the battle for Iwo Jima was still far from over. In the days that followed, Colonel Severance earned the Silver Star, the Marines' third highest decoration for valor after the Medal of Honor and the Navy Cross. The citation stated that in a firefight for a heavily defended ridge, 
He, quote, skillfully directed the assault on this strong enemy position despite stubborn resistance, unquote. Colonel Severance, a captain at the time, commanded Easy Company of the 28th Marine Regiment, 5th Marine Division, part of the 70,000-man Marine force that sought to seize Iwo Jima, seven and a half, uh, excuse me, seven and a half square miles of black volcanic sand about 660 miles south of Tokyo. The island, defended by 21,000 Japanese troops, held airstrips that were needed as bases for American fighter planes and for crippled bombers returning to the Mariana Islands from missions over Japan. Amid heavy casualties, the Marines, by the fifth day of combat on Iwo Jima, had silenced most opposition from Japanese soldiers dug into caves on Mount Suribachi, an extinct volcano 546 feet high at Iwo Jima's southern tip. In mid-morning, a group of Marines from Easy Company raised a flag at the summit, a ceremony photographed by Sergeant Lewis Lowry of the Marine magazine Leatherneck. When James Forrestal, the Secretary of the Navy, who was on the beach below, saw the flag, he requested that it be kept as a memento. After it was returned to the beach, Colonel Severance sent another group of his Marines to bring a larger flag to the mountaintop. It was the raising of that second flag that was portrayed in Rosenthal's dramatic photograph. Both flags are now at the National Museum of the Marine Corps in Quantico, Virginia. Frayed by strong winds, that second flag flew above Mount Suribachi for the remainder of the Iwo Jima, Iwo Jima campaign. And by the way, the Joe Rosenthal photograph, the original, is in the National Archives. The scene he photographed was replicated on a monumental scale as the U.S. Marine Corps War Memorial in Arlington, Virginia, across the Potomac from the National Mall in Washington. The statue is dedicated, quote, to the Marine dead of all wars and their comrades of other services who fell fighting beside them, unquote. Dave Severance, a native of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, joined the Marines in 1938 before the war. He was commissioned as a lieutenant and first saw combat as a platoon commander in the 1943 battle for the Pacific island of Bougainville. His platoon was ambushed and cut off by Japanese troops about a mile behind enemy lines, but fought its way out of an encirclement and wiped out the enemy with the loss of only one Marine. Early in 1944, he was promoted to captain. He had six officers and 240 enlisted men under his command when the Marines landed on Iwo Jima on February 19, 1945. After World War II, Colonel Severance completed flight training and flew fighter aircraft during the Korean War. He completed 69 missions and earned the Distinguished Flying Cross. He was promoted to colonel in 1962 and retired in May 1968 as Assistant Director of Personnel at Marine Headquarters. Now, Colonel Severance was portrayed by Neil McDonough as a Marine captain and by Harvey Presnell as an older man in Flags of Our Fathers, Clint Eastwood's 2006 film about the six men who raised the flag at Iwo Jima. Colonel Severance acted as a consultant for that movie. In a newspaper interview in 2019, when he was asked how he'd like to be remembered, he said, I never thought about it, and then added, just that I was a Marine for 30 years, and I never ended up in jail. Colonel Dave Severance, a veteran of Iwo Jima, was 102 years old. a look at what's new on the Off the Deaton Path bookshelf. You will recall in a previous podcast, I noted the death of renowned historian Bernard Balin on August 7th of 2020 at the age of 97. His final book, published just months before his death, is entitled Illuminating History, a Retrospective of Seven Decades, published by W.W. W. Norton. It's both personal memoir and intellectual autobiography, and as always, the Dean of Historians of Colonial America and the Atlantic World has much to say to us and to teach us. It's a fairly short book, but as with all things Balin, packed with learning and insights. 
It's a final message from one of the most eminent historians of the last 75 years, and I commend it to you. It's Bernard Balin's final book entitled Illuminating History, a Retrospective of Seven Decades, published by W.W. W. Norton. Check it out. On June 19, 1953, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, a couple with two young sons, were executed at Sing Sing Correctional Facility in New York after having been convicted of conspiracy to commit espionage for the Soviet Union. Despite the fact that the U.S. government was aware that the evidence against Ethel was shaky at best and based on the perjury of her own brother. She was 37 years old at her death. Anne Seba, S-E-B-B-A, a former Reuters foreign correspondent and current senior research fellow at the Institute of Historical Research, has written a new book, entitled Ethel Rosenberg, An American Tragedy, published in June by St. Martin's Press. Seba places Rosenberg's death in the context of the Cold War and the McCarthy era with new details of the anti-Semitism and misogyny prevalent during the period, of which, of course, Ethel Rosenberg was a victim. Seba makes full use of the prison letters she exchanged with her husband, her lawyer, and her psychotherapist over a three-year period, two of those years in solitary confinement. As her publisher says, it's a resonant story of what happens when a government motivated by fear tramples on the rights of its citizens. A new book by Ann Seba entitled Ethel Rosenberg, An American Tragedy, published by St. Martin's Press. Finally, how we teach race in American history continues to be a hot and controversial topic in this country, as well as how race and slavery are interpreted and taught at public history sites across the nation. Clint Smith, a staff writer at The Atlantic, has a new book out about this subject, and it's called How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America, published by Little Brown and Company in June. Beginning in his hometown of New Orleans, Smith leads the reader on a tour of monuments and landmarks, those that are honest about the past and those that aren't, that offers an intergenerational story of how slavery and its legacy has been central to shaping our nation's collective history. The book illustrates how some of our country's most essential stories are in fact hidden in plain view and not just here in the South, whether in places we might drive by on our way to work, holidays such as Juneteenth, or entire neighborhoods and places that don't look like historic sites like downtown Manhattan, where slavery and the slave trade were prevalent. It's a new book that has much to say about our current discussions, and it's entitled How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America published by Little Brown and Company, written by Clint Smith. Check it out. And that's a look at what's new on the Off the Deaton Path bookshelf. I hope you are reading something good as well. The hardest working engineer in show business, the czar of our Tallahassee office, as well as the captain of the GHS Elephant Polo team, is our very own Brendan Cannonball Crellin. Our GHS Director of Media Manipulations and Free Elections is Patty Press Release Maher. The GHS Playground Director, Staff Archaeologist, and Fearless Food Taster is Elise, are you going to eat that, Butler. Our GHS Coordinator of Classroom Indoctrination is Lisa War Eagle Landers. The GHS Maven of Social Media and Library Science is Sabrina Human Search Engine Saturday. Our GHS efficiency expert and controller of German-sounding names is Karen Bodenschatz Zollner. The director of the GHS Russian Literature Division is Christy Maple Crisp, assisted by our writing intern, Warren Peace. Our Off the Deaton Path fact checker is Ella Fino. Our GHS cruise activity planner is Eaton Doolittle. The GHS Desi Arnaz biographer is Ike Arumba. Our insurance agent is Heidi Ductable. The staff elections coordinator is Emmanuel Recount. The GHS director of Three Stooges Studies is Lee Iapoca. And our Off the Deaton Path martini mixer is Olive Twist. If you have an iPhone, you can find our podcast at the App Store or on your podcast app on your phone and on Spotify. If you have an Android, find us at Google Play. You can find out everything about the Georgia Historical Society at georgiahistory.com and the Georgia History Festival at georgiahistoryfestival.org. Be sure and like Off the Deaton Path on Facebook and Instagram as well. Please also visit deatonpath.georgiahistory.com and check out dispatches from Off the Deaton Path, 
my blog and similarly Napoleonic-sized headache-inducing podcasts like this one. Stay safe, stay strong. I'm Stan Deaton with the Georgia Historical Society. As always, thank you for listening.